high. Today, I want to talk to you about your freedom. Why did the is the title of my message. Why did the? And I need you to fill in the blank about whatever is keeping you from your freedom. Whatever comes after that, why did the, that prevents you from walking in who it is that God has called you to be? And at the onset of this message, I've got to give you a, uh, a definition of freedom, a definition that we hold to here at Freedom Church. Now, you can go in a dictionary and get a definition. You can go uh, to other places and get a definition. But when we talk about freedom here in this church, the definition that we have for freedom is living completely and fully as God created you to be. Freedom is living completely and fully as God created you to be. I need you to grasp this definition because anytime you're in bondage, you're not living the way God created you to be. If you're in bondage to another person, you're not living in the freedom that God created you to have. If you're in bondage to your own sin and habits, you're not living in the freedom that God has created you to have. If you're living underneath the opinions of other people, you're not living in the freedom. If you're not living in your call or your purpose, you're not free. I need you to understand this, that we got a lot of religious people, but very few free people. The the church is good at producing religious people, people who go to church and who show up in buildings, people who have routines and rituals, people who got do's and don'ts, people who got judgments and critiques, but not a lot of free people who are living out what God has called them to be. We need to learn to be free. The Father created you to be free. When we look in that great garden that was placed in Eden, one of the things that we learn is that God says to Adam when he gives them the command in chapter one to be fruitful and to multiply, to have dominion over the earth, to fill it and to subdue it. We go into Genesis chapter two and we see the specifics of God's call to the man. He forms him from the dust of the ground and man is fully formed. But what we learn as some of us, not only was he formed, he was filled and then he was given a function and that's what created his freedom. Y'all don't miss it. Here it is. Watch. God forms a man, puts him in the garden. He breathes into him his life. Then he places him in the garden. Watch what he says. You are free to eat of every tree in the garden except one tree. God created us for maximum freedom. God God created us for maximum freedom. When God places man in the garden, he does not give him a bunch of don'ts. He gives him a lot of freedom. God does not place a man in the garden and tell him a lot of what he shouldn't do. He gives him a lot of what he can do. Life is full of possibilities to glorify God. You've just been focused on what you can't do. It is amazing to me that in a garden full of everything that the world could imagine, Eve and Adam lock in on the one thing God says not to. And this is the same problem that we find ourselves in today. There is so much that God has in front of you, but you're staring at what God is trying to protect you from. You're, You're trying to touch what it is that God told you to leave alone. And God told me today that he created you for freedom. But I understand why we don't go for freedom. Because when all you've known is Pharaoh, you don't trust the father. I understand why we don't go for freedom, because we've lived with Pharaoh so long that when the father starts to talk to us, we wonder if he's just another taskmaster. We've lived with Pharaoh so long that when the father starts to guide us and direct us, we wonder if he has a hidden agenda, just like that Pharaoh we've been delivered from. Children of Israel, when they find themselves in the wilderness and God is trying to give them direction to get into the promise, they find themselves wanting to go back to Pharaoh. They find themselves saying there was provision in Egypt. There was food there. At least there was shelter. They didn't trust the father because they were so used to Pharaoh. And today I want to break your mindset and break that hole that Pharaoh, Pharaoh, who is Pharaoh? Pharaoh is the devil, the enemy of your soul, the accuser of the brethren, the one who's planted those lies in your mind to have you to believe that you are not what God called you to be, that you don't have the freedom that God wants for you. If he can control your mind, he can control your life. And so in this, 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 this message today, I want to give you a picture of freedom. And as I give you a picture of freedom, I pray that just like we've been doing throughout the whole series, you'll recognize it, you'll receive it, and you'll repeat it to those who need it. John chapter number 8, verse 31 through 36, very familiar passage of scripture. But before I read the text, I need to give you context. 
John chapter number 8 is, is, a, is a message, watch this, that are full of disputes. It's, it's, it's a chapter, rather, that's full of disputes. The first one is a dispute over an adulterous woman. There's a dispute over an adulterous woman. I'm not going to go into that text. Maybe I'll preach that a little bit later on. But, but the Pharisees want to stone this person. I'm not going to use woman because sometimes we focus on the fact that she's a female. They want to stone this person who's lived outside of what the law of God says that should have happened, or, or, or she should have done. And, and Jesus looks at them and says, I need you to understand that what you want to do to her should have been done to you. Y'all missed that. It's the religious people that got quiet right there. He says, what you want to do to her should have been done to you. There's a dispute over an adulterous woman. Th then there's a dispute over Jesus' testimony. They, they say to Jesus, listen, you, you got all this stuff to say. You didn't save this woman from being stoned. But who, who gives witness to your testimony? And Jesus starts going in. He says, see, I don't need witness because the Father bears witness to me. That's why this series uh, called Dad Jokes is good because people are going to start asking you, well, where are you getting this from? I, I get it from my dad. <laughs> I, I get it from my father. There's a dispute over Jesus' testimony because there was a legal thing that says if, if you bear uh, witness of yourself that your testimony is not valid. And Jesus says, I don't bear witness of myself. My father in heaven is bearing witness to me. And, and if you don't believe that, believe the works that I'm doing. Then there's a dispute over who Jesus is. They start wondering, well, who he is? Who is he? Who is the man? And what is he doing? Then we get to the point where they want to question who Jesus is. Jesus says, well, let's have a dispute over whose kids you are. He said, you, you want to talk about who I am and who my daddy is and who bears witness to me. Let's talk about who you are. And eventually he gets to the point where he outright blames them and says, your daddy is the devil, the father of all lies. And he says, that's your problem, but I got a different father. If your daddy is the father of lies, that leads to bondage. My daddy is the father of truth, which leads to freedom. Here's the text. Y'all read it before. To the Jews who have believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied or answered, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free Indeed. I like one translation, a literal translation. It says, if the sun sets you free, you're really free. And I want us to, to think about the fact that we are called to freedom. We are children of God. And Jesus gives us this picture of freedom in this dispute over whose children his opponents are. But for us today, we're going to focus in on what freedom is and what it is for us. And the first thing I want you to do is write down point number one if you're taking notes. And if you're not taking notes, write this down. Freedom is available. Freedom is available. I know that sounds like a simple point, but I need for you to understand that freedom is available. We live in a time where supply chains are short of everything. You can't go into a restaurant and get good service because we don't have enough people to work. You can't get your orders on time because we don't have enough materials to fulfill orders. We, we can't go into certain things and places. Houses are being delayed because there's not enough material for those houses to be done. I was talking to Brandon earlier, and we were talking about his job, and he was saying there are certain things that are stuck in this point and that point because there is a supply chain issue everywhere. We're living in a time of shortages and scarcity. We're living in a time of shortages and scarcity, and what that does is it makes us a little uneasy because when we're living in a time of shortages and scarcity, what we begin to wonder about is what's next? What, what's not going to show up next? You, you remember 2020, the virus that shall be remain, that remain nameless in this room today? Y'all remember 2020? And when people got crazy thinking about the virus that will remain nameless in here today, toilet paper flew off the shelves. And, and, and we didn't know where we were going to get toilet paper from. We, we were set up in zones online, y'all. I don't know if y'all remember that. Some of y'all remember that. We were set up in zones online. And one of the things that would happen is people would begin to tell people where they could find toilet paper. It just didn't seem like that should have been a big deal. I mean, toilet paper is a basic necessity. It's a basic thing. But what happens when what you need is no longer available? 
What happens when what it is that you're used to getting is no longer around? Can I talk to somebody who's been thinking that your freedom is kind of like that toilet paper? It's in short supply or nowhere to be found. I need to remind you that freedom does not come from a supply chain. Freedom does not come from man. Freedom does not come from people. Freedom does not come from some position or performance. Freedom comes from the Father. And the Bible teaches us what will happen when we begin to look into the truth. The Bible says that freedom comes from truth. Look at the text. To the Jews who had believed in him. What what, what does that mean? The text says that there were some Jews who were talking to Jesus and there was a dispute over who he is. I told you, you got to follow this text. You got to understand the context in order to understand the text. There's a dispute over adultery. There's a dispute over Jesus' testimony. Then Jesus starts talking about his identity and then he starts telling them who he actually is. And as he's telling them who he is, watch this, some of these Jews start to believe in him. So watch this, you can believe in him and not yet be free. Because freedom comes after belief, but freedom can't come before belief. Y'all got to read the text. It says, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, which means belief is a first step. But now I can believe what he said, but I got to hold on to it. When I was reading that, I was thinking about this verb to hold. It was saying that it is an aorist verb, which means it is one of those verbs that pops up on an as-needed basis, which means I got to hold this belief in my pocket so that when I get to work and somebody tries to come to me with something that is going to take me out of what it is that I heard, I got to pull it out my pocket and say, I'm holding on to truth. Single people, when you're in a relationship that's trying to lead you into an ungodly uh, precedent and do something that God didn't call you to, you got to reach in your pocket and hold Hold on to what it is that you believe. When the enemy starts to lie to you about what it is that God has shown you and promised you and led you into for your future and your hope, you got to pull that truth out of your pocket and hold on to what it is that he said. When the culture starts to say that what we believe in this book is outdated and antiquated, you got to reach in your pocket and hold on to what it is that you've been taught. I wonder how many believers are not holding to the teaching. I believed it enough to put it in my pocket, but I won't hold on to it when I need it. I believed it enough to frame a verse and put it in my bathroom. But I don't want it enough to hold on to it. This is why we end up in bondage, because we're living out stuff that we don't even believe. Y'all miss this. You say you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but you're living out. He won't supply all my need according to his riches and glory, which is in Christ Jesus. You're living out stuff that you don't even believe. You say you believe that there is no one greater than him, yet your boss is the person that you fear most in your life. You're living out stuff you don't believe. You believe that he's a good, good father, yet you're going to sleep at night worried about what's going to happen the next day. You're living out stuff you don't even believe. You believe that he's a restorer, a way maker, a healer, and yet you're still living in that bitterness and that unforgiveness of the past and the things that you've dealt with. You're living out stuff you don't even believe because you can believe and be in bondage at the same time. I believe this is the reason why God called us to be a church of freedom because there are people who believe but need to be set free. Bondage is the burden that comes from a lie. Jesus says to the Jews who believed in him, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. So if you hold to my teachings, you're really my disciples. Here's what he says. You got a lot of people saying they're disciples of Jesus. This is why Dr. Tony Evans makes a distinction between Christians and disciples. Because you got a lot of people who say they believe in Jesus, but are there a lot of people who are holding on to the teaching? Do you have a lot of people who are living out what it is that Christ has called them to? Or you have a, do you have a lot of people who are saying, that I'm going to do it? He says, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Do you know the Bible talks about a great falling away? That there's going to be a great falling away? Where does this falling away come from when people who, who said they were believers are no longer in the church? They're no longer there. You know, we're seeing it now that, that there's this thing that, that's going around in our culture called deconstruction. Now, I ain't mad at deconstruction. I'm going to be honest, because the only person that's afraid of deconstruction is the person who didn't build something solidly. Can, can, we talk, can I say that again? 
And if you don't know what deconstruction is, it's a movement among young uh, Christians that are saying, I got to pick my faith apart to see if it's really real. And I'm good with it because at, at the heart of my faith is the rock. At the heart of my faith is Jesus. At the heart of my faith is an indisputable Savior who rescued me from the pit of my sin. And so I'm okay with deconstruction because what my faith is built on is solid. Here's the reality, though. There's this deconstruction that's happening, and there are people who are falling away because what they believed, they did not hold to, and they're not true disciples. And so what's happening is people are walking away from the faith because they did not pay attention to this verse. To the Jews who had believed, we have done you a disservice because in order to get in relationship with Jesus, hear me clear, all you got to do is believe. But in order to live this Christian life of freedom, you got to hold on. I don't have to do it. Once I believe, that's all I need. Who lied to you? You need to believe to get in. That belief is what we do to get in. Like, I didn't need to work to earn his love. We're missing the point when it comes to what belief means. Belief means I heard the message, the spirit touched my heart. I transformed because I believed. But I got to hold on. If Jesus says to do it, I got to do it. If he says stay away from it, I got to stay away from it. I've got to hold on. Bondage is the burden born from a lie, and many people will fall away because they are not holding to the teaching of the Father and the Messiah. Watch this. Although we were created for freedom, we have a glitch in our operating system that prevents us from living in freedom. We get stuck. We get stuck. And so what happens is, you ever used an uh, Android? Anybody got an Android phone? Anybody got an Android phone? I'm, I'm about to talk about you. I'm about to talk about you. I had an Android once. I had an Android once. I had an Android once. And, and, and what, what happened was, what happened was, when, when I got the Android, when I got the Android, it would do something on me. It would freeze up on me. And I, and I, and I loved my Android, Lynn Roy. I did. I loved it. I had an HTC Hero. It's one of the first ones. Y'all, that's old school right there. Y'all know nothing about that. Had an HTC Hero. I loved it. I mean, it was cool, man. Maybe it was Sprint. I'm blaming Android. Maybe it was Sprint. But that thing used to freeze up. No, nah, Sprint ain't got nothing to do with the operating system. I'm trying to get y'all past. It would freeze up on me. And sometimes I could cut it off, turn it back on, you know, the little power button, and it'd come back on and be working fine. Other times it'll freeze. Ain't nothing happened. You know what I had to learn? It would ask me if I wanted to force quit the app. Y'all ever seen that force quit? Got to force quit the app. So what that means is you got to shut the app down and it'll come back up. There were times when it got so bad, though, I had to reset the whole phone <laughs> B- because, because it was designed to function a certain way. But the glitch on the inside of it made me, means I had to reset it if I wanted to use it again. Y'all, let's talk about your freedom for just a second. You were designed to live in freedom, but the glitch that sin has put in your mind, your heart, your hands, your feet, the glitch that the devil has placed in your path, the glitch that he has given you has you stuck in a certain position, stuck in a certain bondage, stuck with certain habits. You need, somebody say, I need a reset. You you need a hard reset. And here's the way to freedom that's clearly laid out in the text. He works it out. He says to the Jews who have believed in him, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Here's a formula. Write it down. It's going to be on the screen. One, you need a prerequisite. That's belief. You got to have a prerequisite. If you're going to walk in freedom, you got to have a prerequisite. There are people who claim to be free who really aren't because they don't believe in Jesus. Because freedom, watch, you got to go back to my definition, is living completely and fully as God created you to be. And you were created to be in relationship with him. So anybody who says, I'm enjoying financial freedom that ain't a Christian, is living in financial freedom but spiritual bondage. And I don't even know if their financial freedom is fully free because there may be some things that God wanted to open up to them that they're missing because they ain't in relationship. There's a prerequisite for freedom and it's belief. Then there's a process to freedom. It's holding on to the truth. He says there's a process to freedom. Then there's a pattern. That's being a disciple. The word, the word uh, uh, disciple in the Greek is the word mathetes. And, and it is the word where we get our word mathematic from. And when you look at the original word for, for math and where it comes from, it talks about patterns of science that produce certain things. Watch. That being a disciple of Jesus means you are patterning your life after him. 
Jesus said, I do nothing unless I see the Father do it, which means Jesus is patterning after the Father. You're patterning after Jesus, which means ultimately we got a paternal example. Y'all missed it. We got a paternal example, a pattern of an example that's going to produce in us freedom. The reason why you want to be Christ-like is because you want to be free. Because there's a prerequisite, a process, and a pattern which leads to the product. The product is freedom. Write this down. Keep this. Do something with it. The prerequisite, the process, plus the, uh, plus the pattern equals the product, and that is freedom. Not only do we have uh, this, this verse, these two verses that tell us that freedom is available, that should produce a bunch of hope inside of you. We, we do need to understand, and I need to be responsible and teach this, freedom isn't automatic. Freedom is available, but freedom isn't automatic. I need you to see this in verses 33 and 34. They answered him. He just said, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, the text starts with saying they believed him. The, the text says that they believed him. The next words out of his mouth says that you will know the, fr- the truth, and the truth will set you free. They get offended by what he says. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? One of the most difficult roles of a leader is to try and take people to a place they don't believe they need to go. I, I, I deal with it. I live it. Uh, I can only imagine Jesus, who, who is the ultimate visionary because he created the beginning and the end. The, the most difficult task of a leader is trying to take people to a place they don't think they need to go. And, and when they say, oh, I believe you, I'll follow you, as long as my truth agrees with your truth, we cool. But as soon as I tell you something that is in contradiction to what it is that you think you believe, even though you've chosen Jesus as your leader, even though you've chosen that, that, that person as your leader, people go with you as long as you're telling their version of the truth. But as soon as you shift course, as soon as you say something they don't like, as soon as you say something that might call them out, watch, Jesus says, you guys aren't free yet. This belief is just a prerequisite. This belief in me is just the beginning. You're not free yet. There are some things you need to do. And the Jews answer him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. Pause. Wait a minute. We talk about Israel, the Jews, the people that have been in bondage to everybody. I mean, we can go back to the beginning, right? When we get ourselves out of Genesis, the next book is called the Exodus. Well, where are you exiting? You're exiting out of slavery. These are the people who have been enslaved to the Egyptians. At least seven times in the book of Judges, they find themselves under the bondage of some foreign nation because of the fact that they have not obeyed God. Then they go through the kings and the, uh, 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 and the chronicles, and you realize that there were some good kings, but many bad kings, and God takes them into exile. Babylon, Assyria, then there was Greece, and now, right now, while they're talking to Jesus, Rome has them oppressed. And they say, we are Abraham's descendants. We have never been in bondage. The word that they use there is from the root word deluo, which is the word slave, doulos. And here's what it sounds like in English to me. Don't quote me. This ain't theological. Sound like delusion. Because the hardest person to convince uh, that they're a slave is a slave. Some Harriet Tubman made the statement, I I freed a thousand slaves and would have freed a thousand more if only they would have known they were slaves. this This is the thing, that freedom is available, but freedom is not automatic. God's deliverance has become so dependable to the Jewish people that his people have become delusional about his deliverance. But maybe they've come up with some theological uh, Simone Biles gymnastic that helps them to think, well, well, every time we came out, so maybe we weren't in bondage. It was the sovereignty of God. No, it was God's sovereignty along with your slavery. And there are some of you who are in bondage today, and you're blaming God for your, habit, your habits. You're blaming God for your lack of progress. You're so spiritual that you're blaming God that you have not moved forward in the direction that God has called you to. You're delusional. You're not spiritual. Ooh, that's tough. I'm sorry. That's, that's tough. I, 
I didn't mean to sound this. I didn't mean to say that that rough. I just, need to, I just need to free somebody in here today. Stop ignoring what it is that the Lord is trying to teach you by giving God an excuse for why you won't obey him. Y'all, y'all didn't read the text. Y'all, y'all didn't read the text. This, this is the word speaking to them. They got a word in rebuttal to the word. They, they got a word in rebuttal to the word. They answered him. We are Abraham. They're going to school Jesus. This is why later in the text in John chapter 10, he said, before Abraham was, I am. He says, y'all keep using Abraham like I'm impressed. Y'all keep talking Moses like I don't know Moses. I made Moses. God says, you, listen, listen. And some of y'all, come here, come here. Because some of y'all say, I would never do that when Jesus is in my face. But what do you do when this is in your face? I would never do that if Jesus was in my face. What what would you do if this was in your face? I need you to stop telling the word your word. They answer, we are Abraham's descendants. I've never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say we shall be set free? Uh, This this, this automatic deliverance that kept coming to them, they they didn't realize that their freedom wasn't automatic because God kept delivering them. He kept bringing them out. You know why God kept bringing them out? Because they couldn't die in their sin because a savior had to come from them. Don't miss this. I'm about to help you. I, I, got on, I stepped your toes. You can say, ouch. I'm about to have you say hallelujah in a minute. He says, I can't let you die as slaves because the savior's got to come from you. Watch this. He said, there's a purpose on your life. Although you've been in bondage, I'm always going to bring you out until you fulfill what it is that I've called you. Now, you'll keep circling around this mountain. You'll keep going through all this stuff. That's so you can learn the lesson so that when the deliverer does come, this will be the, the, the result of it. Can I talk to somebody who's scared that you've done your last thing, that God's not going to forgive you? God says, no, nah, until your purpose is fulfilled. You can't die. Until your purpose is fulfilled, you're going to get out of this thing. Until your purpose is fulfilled, I'm going to bring you out. Why? Because God is a consistent deliverer. He's not the God of a second chance. If he was only the God of a second chance, your boy be dead. But because he's the God of a chance and 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 a chance, I'm still here. Uh, But it gets so automatic that we become delusional. Uh, I got this popcorn maker at the house. Uh, I got this popcorn maker at the house, and I don't like to use it because it's it's so hard to clean. So I've gone back to my handy-dandy microwave, and I got a decent microwave, right? So what we do is I put the popcorn, the microwave with popcorn, in the, I love popcorn, though. I love popcorn. (laughs) You want to give me a Father's Day gift, get your boy some popcorn. Amen. Here here it is. Watch. Uh, I love popcorn. So when I'm popping my popcorn, I put the bag in. We got a uh, a sensitized popcorn sensor inside the deal. So I don't burn my popcorn because I put it in there. I push popcorn. It does its thing. I walk away. When it's done, it calls me. Beep. 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 I interpret. I know that language. Your popcorn is ready, Mr. White. (laughs) That's what it's saying. It's interpretation. You got to know how to speak in tongues. Amen. (laughs) I got the gift. Amen. Says, Mr. White, your popcorn is ready. So I go and I get my popcorn, perfectly popped popcorn. I get it every time I go there. And it's been so, come so automatic, so automatic that the other day I was here at the church. And, and, our, and our, our microwave ain't, ain't, as, uh, ain't as fancy as the one at the house. And you, you remember what it used to be like uh, when you had to pop popcorn, you had to listen. You had to watch it. You, you, you had to sit there. You, 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 you look in the bag and it says, uh, three to seven minutes. Now, that's a big range. That's a, that's a big range. Then it has some instructions behind three to seven minutes. It say, it say to you, it say, it say uh, uh, listen. Listen. So, so when the popcorn's popping down, pop, 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 and they say, when the popcorn stops popping two to three seconds, then you need to pull it out or it'll start to burn. I'm, I'm in there, and I'm so used to the automatic deliverance of my popcorn <laughs> that I put my popcorn in there for a certain time. And then what happens is it starts, ah, pop, 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 and it starts slowing down. And I'm waiting for it to say, Mr. White, your popcorn is ready that I stopped listening. <laughs> I'm waiting for it to do what it automatically did before, so I stopped listening. And what happened is the thing goes, beep, beep, and I go grab it out. And then I shake it up like I always do. I open it in the cabinet and said, did you burn your popcorn? I said, I didn't burn it, the microwave did. But it wasn't the microwave's fault. I had gotten so used to the microwave doing what I was supposed to do that I couldn't get deliverance when it was my time. Ah, I need you to understand. 
that God keeps delivering you out of situations that he's called you to walk through, that he's called you to mature through, that you're getting burnt up in the fire by the enemy because you stop listening. You stop looking. You stop paying attention to what it is that the Lord was saying. Freedom is available, but it's not automatic. You got some work to do. I got I gotta move quick, I gotta move quick. So Jesus then responds to the Jews. And he tells them there are three enemies of your freedom. Write this down. This is, uh, I was trying to teach, but y'all got me happy. Here it is. Jesus replied, they, they answered, Jesus answered. It's a, it's a ping pong match of truth. Jesus replied, very truly, I say to you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Watch what Jesus says. I need y'all to understand something. I've already given you one of the keys and you missed it because you forgot how to listen. I'm going to give you another key and you better pay attention. Jesus says, watch, I'm not even going to respond to this statement that you've never been in bondage to anyone because that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Here's what he says. There are three enemies to your freedom. I gave you one already. He said, the first enemy of your freedom is ignorance. He says, you'll know the truth. And the truth will set you free. I told you that bondage is, the bir is birthed out of lies. Bondage is born from lies. Watch this. Ignorance is an enemy of your freedom. You've been given the word of God for the purpose of you having the knowledge to apply so that you can live free. You didn't get the word of God just so that you can memorize the verse of the day and talk to somebody in a Bible drill and tell them how fast you are to get to a text. You got the Bible so that you can, watch this, apply it to your heart. You got the Bible so that, so that what David said, watch, we're going to go to the next one. Uh, immorality is an enemy of your freedom. Immorality is an enemy of your freedom. David said, your word I have hidden in my heart. That takes care of the ignorance. So that I might not sin against you. What did we define sin as? Sin is illegitimately trying to find your identity in anything other than God. I'm going to say it again. Sin is illegitimately trying to find your identity in something other than God. Because y'all looking at sin, and listen, the reason why I come hard for religious people, because I know what type of people we got at this church. Yeah. Folk who come to church and hear the word, and they're excited about it, and they're good, but, but, but I know sometimes, listen, what you need to do is you need to stop looking at other people's issues and calling that sin and ignoring your lack of progress and not calling that sin. Yeah. For him who knows to do good but does not do it, to him it's sin. Yeah. And sin, listen, y'all hear sin, y'all like, ah, sin, That's a, it's like you're on fire, you can't, you know? You can start freaking out when you hear sin. Sin is illegitimately trying to find your identity in anything other than God. What is sin? Separation from the Father. Which means I try to find it in sex. I try to find my identity in money. I try to find my identity in being liked. I try to find my identity in food. I try to find my identity in my wife. I try to find my identity in my husband. I try to find my identity in my gender. I try to find my identity in my whatever. And here's what God says, I need you to find your identity in me. I gave you the word so that it reveal my character so that you would know who you are as it relates to me. So your immorality is an enemy of your freedom because you were created for relationship with God. So when, I, when Jesus says, watch this, that you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free, he's saying get to know the word. And then he says, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. He said, listen, I'm not even going to address the fact that you've been enslaved to the Romans and the Greeks and the Assyrians and the Babylonians. You a sinner, though. I love this part because Romans, Paul would come back later and say, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Here's what he says, because he wants you to know that everybody has lived in bondage at some point. At some point in this, in this journey uh, in our church, we want to offer you four different uh, opportunities. One, for foundation, for you to learn everything you can about this faith that we believe. But the next step that we want you to have is a step called freedom. I don't want to hear anybody in this church tell me they don't need freedom. If immorality, sin, identifying with something other than God, or finding your identity in something other than God, is what everybody has done, you need freedom. You may not need it like somebody next to you. I don't care what your addiction or your habit is. You still need to be broken from it. We want to take you through that. Then we want to form you. We want formation so that you can live out your calling. Why? Because freedom is living completely and fully as God has called you to, created you to be. How are you free if you don't know what you're called to? 
and then fruits. The Bible says that you'll know a tree by the fruit that it bears. Here's the problem. We got bare branches talking about how free they are. It's, it's the season, watch this, where people can talk about it. I'm so tired of people who can talk about it but don't live it. I told Catherine the other day, I'm going to tell on myself, this ain't even in my notes. Help me, Holy Spirit. Uh, I told Catherine the other day, I said, I got a theological intimacy but a relational distance with rest. Think about what I'm saying. I got a theological intimacy with it. I preached on it. I remember one week I had Marcus and Titus, and Marcus was playing, Titus was playing the drum, and Marcus was up here dancing, and I was talking about rest is a rhythm. Anybody remember that message? Rest is a rhythm. Rest is a rhythm. And I, da, 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 and I gave you all this. Y'all was like, oh, that's good, Pastor. I'm going to give me a Sabbath. And for the month of June, I'll be preaching 25 out of 30 days. Stupid. Because I got a theological intimacy and a relational distance with something. That means I ain't free. I got to ask myself, why did I take all of these engagements? I could tell myself that I just want to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the Bible says, the blessings of the Lord make a one rich and add no sorrow to it. When I'm laying up at night thinking about what I'm going to have to preach this next time, and I'm stressed out, oh, I'm tired, I'm messed up, I got to drive when I leave here to go preach again tonight. The Lord told me, he says, you got a theological intimacy with a relational distance with it. There are many of us who are not free, and our fruit is not being born. With bare branches saying we're free. That fruit, that ain't good fruit. But I'm producing it at it. And be, I'm, I'm, the reason why I'm transparent is because I want y'all to understand, I'm not talking at you. I'm living this thing out with you. The, the, the enemies of freedom, ignorance, immorality, and individualism, or independence, independence, independence. It is our desire to get or have freedom apart from God. And when you go studying how to be free in one area of your life, but you don't consult God, I won't go back to this because I helped with it last week, that that is a, that is a level of bondage. You're asking everyone else's opinion, but you don't go to the Father who wants to provide for and love you. That's a level of bondage. You're in bondage. Listen, I, taught, I did a whole series on the Enneagram, and there are certain personalities that need knowledge and information, and that's not a problem. That's because you're made in the image of God. But that becoming an idol is now a part of your bondage, and you need to release yourself from it and allow God to take you into places that you have no clue what's going to happen next. Freedom is available. Freedom isn't automatic but last freedom is announced freedom is announced i love this because the text uh, jesus tells them very truly i tell you everyone who sins is a slave to sin now a slave has no permanent place in the family but a son belongs to it forever so if the son sets you free you are free indeed that's the one we know right if the son sets you free you are free indeed i told you i got to complete faith freedom and fatherhood in the one message and Jesus flips this whole thing on his head and he says you know this is a fatherhood text right he says I need you to understand that who your daddy is is why you think well how you think but because of who my daddy is is how I think how I think see he understands that his destiny his life his identity is not a slave but is free but not only is his destiny his identity and his his lot to be free it's to set other people Jesus says, not enough that I have freedom that's available to me. I need to announce it to everybody else. Uh, my kids, my kids uh, oftentimes will, uh, will, will come to me and say, hey, can so-and-so spend the night? I mean, they'll probably do it today. I, I, I'm not going to say yes or no because I won't be there. I got to go preach. I told you, I'm going to be gone. But here's the reality. They come to me and say, can so-and-so spend the night? And, and nine times out of ten, I'm like, sure. I don't mind. And, and, and the kids love to, to uh, that was a mama right there. She said, like, hmm, did you ask your wife? That was Ms. Rita Thompson. She's like, did you ask your wife? That was that. I, was, I, I got that. I don't ask her most of the time, Rita. I don't ask her most of the time. I will say ask your mother when I don't want to answer. But, 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 but the girls will say, hey, can so-and-so spend a night? And I say, sure. They can spend a night. And the reason why I believe that my house has become the place to, to, to hang out. Now, 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 my mama raised me that I'd rather them be at my house than I have them all over the place because I don't know what's going on everywhere else. Now, 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 now that's, that's one thing. That's one thing. But the other thing is, the other thing is, I've created an environment where they feel loved and welcome. I've created an environment where as the father, watch this, I don't treat my kids' friends like servants or strangers. I treat them like I treat my kids. 
I, I treat them the way that I treat my children. So when they come over, I don't have them sit in places that I wouldn't allow my kids to sit. I don't feed them food that I wouldn't feed my kids. I wouldn't take, if I'm taking the, us out, I'm taking everybody out. If we hanging out, I'm going to hang out with everybody. They're invited by my kids. They're loved by my kids. So I treat them like one of my kids. All I ask is that you respect my kids. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. I I will treat them like my kids because they've been invited by my kids. That means on the word of my child, you become a child. On the word of my daughter, you become a daughter. On the word of my daughter, you become, you're loved by my daughter and I'm going to love on you. And, and, and you, 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 you're here with my daughter. You get all the rights and privileges. You become co-heir with her. You, you, you get everything that happens in the house. Well, as long as you're in the house, all I ask you to do is when you're in my house, respect my kids. Respect my kids. Here's the thing. Jesus says, watch this, a slave is not in the house forever. Can I theologically help you understand that Exodus chapter 21 and verse 2 said this is not the same slavery that you understood from what we were trying to be free from in the Opal Lee video. This slavery was people selling themselves into slavery to take and erase some debt. And the Bible says, I don't even want that to last forever. Don't miss it. He says in Exodus 21 and 2, he says, after six years, when your slave works for you, in the seventh year, set him free. Because we were created to be free. That even if I get into a bind and have to sell myself into somebody, God said, I made provision for you to come out. Jeez, that's a good God. That even if I put myself in bondage, he said, I made provision for you to come out. That's a word for somebody who thinks they're stuck right now. Freedom is available. Freedom is not automatic. But freedom is announced. Who announces it? The Bible says it's the son who announces it. That a slave is not permanent. After seven years, the slave gets to be free. And then they're released from the house. They no longer have the covering of the house. They no longer have the protection of the house. They no longer have the provision of the house. They no longer have the amenities of the house. Slaves get released, but sons live forever. They get the inheritance. Come here, prodigal son. Prodigal son says, I went away for a little bit, but it's always going to be my house. I can come back when I'm ready. I can come back when I come to myself. Jesus says, and if the son makes you free, you're free indeed. I heard my daughter say, Daddy, they're coming over. I said, well, if you bring them in the house, they're welcome indeed. If you bring them into this fold, they're welcome indeed. But mess around and try to take advantage of one of my kids. Now we got a problem. Here's the problem with the church in the 21st century. We don't look like, nor do we respect Jesus. And the Bible says that if you know the son, then then you get this freedom. And if the son makes you free, then you're free indeed. But we've been disrespecting the son. The son made an announcement. He says, Daddy, I invited them. Daddy, I love them. John 17, I love them to the end. So Daddy says, I'm going to treat them like one of my kids. That's all I'm asking is that you respect my kids. Uh, I'm closing. I was thinking about this, that. Freedom is announced. It's announced by the son. He says, if the son makes you free, you free indeed. They were listening to the son make an announcement of freedom that they would not even fully receive. He's making an announcement of freedom right in their faces. And I can see how announcements of freedom are always followed by attacks from the enemy. This is good. Announcements of freedom are always followed by attacks from the enemy. July 4th, 1776, Americans signed the declaration or announcement of independence. Following the announcement of them deciding they wanted to be independent, there is a war because freedom is available, but it's not automatic. And even when it's announced, it will be attacked. They have to fight for freedom. Uh, Here's the problem, though, and I'm not trying to be political, but the reality is some of us get freedom. And when we get freedom, we don't think it's for everybody, it's just for us. So July 4th, 1776, there were people who declared their freedom. And the attack on their freedom, they won against the attack. But now that they got freedom, they don't deem it necessary for other people to have freedom. And so for hundreds of years, they enslave other people and give them and then take away from them what they sought to have themselves. But on January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation, proclamation. you see these words, declaration, proclamation, the announcement of freedom was made. 
on January 1st, 1863, that an announcement of freedom is made. This announcement of freedom, though, is not necessarily heeded to. There was a war that is fought prior to that, but there is another war that is fought for two and a half years. Why? Because people didn't want to release what it is that they felt they owned. There's this thing where even when you get a word from your own uh, authority that you begin to rebel because you're afraid and insecure about what it is that you might lose. That, that on January 1st, 1863, slavery in this country became illegal and abolished but for two and a half years. You would think that it was, you, you know, when, when some people first heard about, about the two and a half years, they thought, well, you know, they didn't have the internet then, you know. News travels fast, but truth is always in traffic. So they say to themselves, January 1st, 1863, they had the internet. It wasn't no Instagram that declared we were free. So it took two and a half years. Now that ain't what was happening. There were people who were refusing to give freedom. I need somebody to understand that the enemy is going to refuse to give you your freedom. He heard the announcement. He understands the availability. I'm talking about the spiritual now. I'm not, I'm not in no political stuff. Uh, I'm talking about the fact that the enemy wants you to remain in bondage. You know that after this message, that thing that God wants you delivered from is going to be the thing that comes up in your life this week? You know that that thing that's always been bugging you is going to be that thing that pops up in the next 90 days. You know that thing that the enemy knows that you're contemplating right now. As a matter of fact, he's placing it in your heart right now for guilt and shame and to tell you that you've not been delivered. He's going to bring that thing up to you after this message. You know why? Because the announcement is always followed by an attack. He won't let you walk into your victory. But June 19th, 1865. Over two and a half years later, uh, General Granger, Opal Lee already taught you, if you were here on time, you saw the video. General Granger said, watch this, I got an order. Uh, General order number three, General Gordon Granger says that everyone has absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves. Here's what he declares. He declares that not only are you free, but there's an equality, that everything that the enemy was using over you, you now have the ability to use it. You, you, it's, God says, I'm going to use it for your good. Notice what he says. He said absolute equality of person. That means, watch this, that the people were equal, that, that the enemy could no longer say that you were subordinate, that God says, I've elevated your identity. He said there's an announcement in freedom of the elevation of your identity, that your personhood has been elevated. You are, I've told you this before, I won't keep harping it, but you are a son and a daughter of the king. But he also says, watch this, that property should be equal. Now that never happened. Can I just be real? Yeah. That never happened, but it was declared. Which means, if it's been announced, if it's been announced, now, now, America can lie, but I want to talk about freedom. The Bible says, he says, that also property, watch this, that everything that the enemy was using you to work for him, the Bible says this now, you get it now. He said there are promises that are yes and amen in Jesus, and now you get these certain promises. And I know America can lie, and I'm not going to hold my breath for America to hold up her end of the bargain. But I do have a God in heaven who the Bible says God is not a man that he should lie. He said, if you give up house or mother or father, you will get it back. Watch this. In this life and in the next, freedom is available, but it's not automatic. But it has been announced. And if it's announced, it's in the atmosphere. And if it's in the atmosphere, it's on the way. I wish I had somebody who was excited because the freedom that he promised you is just around the corner. You just got to keep persevering. You just got to keep pressing. You just got to keep moving. You just got to keep obeying. You just got to keep believing. You just got to keep holding on to truth so that when the freedom comes, you'll be free indeed. Stand up. Let's get out of here. The reality is this message is for every single person under the sound of my voice. But there are three categories of how this message can be applied. Number one, maybe you're here today and you need to meet the prerequisite. And I told you the prerequisite is belief. What do you need to believe? You need to believe that Jesus is the son who has the authority to make the announcement of your freedom. 
that he gets to invite you into the house. What does the house represent? The house represents the kingdom of God. It represents the freedom you were created for. It represents the forgiveness of sin. It's the son who gets to make this announcement. It's the son who gets to say that they can come in. What do you need to do? You just need to believe in him. He says it right here. To those Jews who believed in him, he starts giving them the keys. He starts giving them the keys. And here's what I need for you to understand. If you're here today and you're confused and maybe you think, have I given my life to Jesus for real? Well, this may be a good time for you to do it. If you're confused about it, just give him your life. What is it going to hurt you? Your grandmama and them is not going to be upset if they're really saved. You know, I've come across this, this, this trend. The people that say, well, I don't know what they're going to say. I got baptized at so-and-so church 30 years ago. What are they going to say? What is Jesus going to say? What is Jesus going to say? This is not about the relationship that you have with an address. This is about a relationship that you have with a Savior. And today he's calling you to repent. To repent of what? Every illegitimate thing you've tried to do to find your identity in something other than him. He says, you can change your mind. You can find total freedom in Jesus today. That's the first call. Believe. Take the prerequisite. The next person I'm talking to is the person who needs to hold on. We're living in a season right now where life is difficult. It is tough. The things that we see and hear and imagine, experience, are rough. But here's what the Lord told me to tell you. It's time for us to get a grip on the Word of God and hold on. I'm challenging some of you in here who have been weary and ready to give up. Hold on. I want to challenge some of you who've been thinking, is it worth it? And so you are trying to find your identity. You're, you're slipping back into sin. You're trying to find your identity. You're giving your life to Jesus. You're one of those people who already believe. But you're slipping back into finding your identity in things that are not in him. And I'm not saying he can't inform those things. But your identity has to be found in him. Identity in him, information from him. And here's what I need for you to do. I need for you to make a commitment today that you are going to hold to his teaching. How are you going to hold to his teaching? How can they hear if they don't get a preacher? There's some of you who need to commit to being a part of this family today. You, I know we don't have the, the class until the first week in August, but you come and you tell somebody in the hallway, I want to be a part of this family. I need to be under the teaching. I need to be in this place of growth. I need that foundation. I need that freedom. I need that formation. I need to bear that fruit. Some of you, you it's the antidote to what it is that you've been dealing with. You just need to make this first step of obedience. The first week of the series, I told you that when you obey, immediately heaven is open. And the reason why some of us are struggling and overwhelmed is because we have not obeyed the next step that God has called us to. Some of you need to believe, others of you need to hold on. There's a third group of you, though. There's a third group of you. And this group, this group, I'm excited to talk to you. I'm excited to talk to you because you say, I'm faithful, Reverend. I've been here. I've been believing. You baptized me with your own hands. Brandon baptized me in the pool in that corner. Ah, I'm committed. I've been here. I've been in every group you've ever offered. Here's my question now. Will you be a herald and make the announcement to others that freedom is possible? We've gotten away from evangelism, Gene. We've gotten away from sharing the gospel because when we open up our mouths, we're scared of what they might say about our radical belief. We're scared of what they might say about this belief that we have being a peculiar people. I'm challenging some people who will not knock on doors and beat people up with a track. I'm talking about people who with their lives and their mouths will begin to proclaim that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. I'm talking about people who will love people like Jesus wants them free. I'm talking about people who will minister to people like Jesus wants them free. I'm talking about people who are willing to take that extra step and begin to announce the gospel. To just say, I know it. It's another thing to be an announcer. We've been given this ministry of reconciliation. But yet we're not reconciling anyone or anything to ourselves, to God. So today the call is for those of you who need to believe. And here's what you can do. The prayer team's going to come in just a second here. And when the prayer team comes, you can come and you can say to them, hey, I believe. And I want to give my life to Jesus. Or you can go two rights, quick rights. Go out the doors, quick rights, two rights. Go to the hub and say, hey, I want to give my life to Jesus. And if that's for you today, give your life to Jesus. Believe. Believe. 
You do not get freedom until you believe. To the second person, I need you to hold on. What is your next step? Two rights. Two rights. Go ask somebody in the hub and say, hey, I need to take a next step. What, what should I do? And if they don't have an answer for you, come see me. she be like, Pastor, I need to talk to you. I just need to talk to you. How do I go to this next place in my faith? Hold on. Let me help you with that. And then the last person, and there's a lot of you in here. I know you. I trust you. I believe you. It's time to announce. It's time to announce. It's time to announce. That means the empty seat next to you, the, announce, the announcement that you make is going to be the person sitting in that seat. It's time, it's time to announce. 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 Jesus came preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I came to announce the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I came to announce. I came to announce. I came. I can't get off of this. I came to announce. I came to announce that broken hearts are going to be healed. I came to announce that diseases are going to be supernaturally taken care of. I came to announce. I came to announce that relationships are going to be mended. I came to announce that the bitterness that's been eating you up inside is going to be healed. I came to announce that that worry and anxiety is going away. I came to announce. I need you to be a herald. I need you to be an announcer. I need you to be an announcer. So if any of those three belong to you, the prayer team, come now, come now, come now. Who, prayer team, where you are, wherever you are around this room, you come now. They're going to be available to pray with you. They're going to be available to pray with you. You can come to them at any point through the rest of this service for any one of those three reasons. Or if you want to go quick, right, quick, listen, if you need prayer for any reason, even other than the three I mentioned, please come. If I didn't mention your thing, don't think that they're not going to pray for you. No, that's why they're here. They're anointed and prepared to pray for whatever it is that you're dealing with. Major decisions in your life, come get prayer. Transitions and change, come get prayer. Just needing to hold on, come get prayer. The Bible says that my house shall be called a house of prayer. So we ought to pray. Amen. Let me pray. Uh, then we'll get ready to dismiss. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power that you have communicated with even in my frailty, God. And what it is that I've mixed up, we know that you've cleaned up. God, that the hearts of your people have been pricked by your spirit and that they are now ready to receive what it is that you have said. God, that we've got believers that are coming to you today. God, that we've got people who will be holding on because of the word today. And we've got announcers who are going to go out and share what it is that you're doing in the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, put your hands together. And give God praise in here today. Amen. If you need prayer, you can start coming now. I just got a couple of quick things, and then we'll be out of here. First things first, happy Father's Day again to the fathers. If you go out to the hub, yes, you can give it up for the fathers. You can hang those two rights, and there is a chair there. Uh, I am not responsible for this color scheme. That's Marcus Brookins. Uh, go out there and uh, sit in the, the seat and take uh, a seat and, ex and ex just experience being a king. You're a king, and we want you to sit in that king seat, uh, never, never dethroning the king, but sitting as a king who has a king. Amen. Uh, we want to also inform you, married couples, married couples, freedom marriages, and forever I do, are putting together a, a luau next week. My man, Mark and Leanne, are hosting us at their house. So if you have not signed up, space is limited. You need to sign up. We will turn you over. You won't even get the address. We won't even have to turn you away at the door. You won't even get the address. It's at a secret location. Don't try to follow Mark home today. He's watching you. Uh, but there's a luau next week for the couples. Let's get together and enjoy ourselves as couples. Amen? Amen. Hey, listen, uh, one last week of this series, please invite somebody. i got a powerful uh, word that I want to share uh, with us from the Father's love, and I want you to invite people that need to hear it. You say, well, what is it? Don't matter. It's the word of God. They need it. Just bring them here and get them in the room. Uh, as it relates to uh, how we do things here at Freedom, I want to say thank you to those of you who bring it. Here at Freedom, we don't just give, we bring it. The Bible says bring all the tithes to the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. There are certain things that we are planning and getting ready to do that we believe God is going to be. Listen, Summer Vibes went off really well and was exciting because of the fact that you bring it. Listen, we had over four salvations or rededications that happened during the week. Come on. My daughter, my daughter, Michaela, she came up to me and she said, are we going to do Summer Vibes every year? 
I said, yeah, we're going we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna to see about that because I don't like to commit to nothing forever, you know. I said, we're going to see about that. It seemed like something we're going to try to do. She said, because that was amazing. And when the kids start saying it's amazing, y'all, that's something that we want to do. And adults, did y'all have a good time as well? Amen. And so just because you bring it, we're able to do things like that, and we're able to do it with excellence. You know, we had ATVs and lifeguard stands and all kind of things in here. So we want to make sure that uh, that we get to take it to the next level. So as you bring it, not only to do things like that, but we get to bless people. There are people who are blessed that you will never even hear about because you bring it. And so if you're a tither, I just want to say thank you. If you're on the cusp of tithing, I want to challenge you today to go ahead and do it. And, and I got people who can attest to being blessed because they did it. They're blessed because they did it. And so not only will you be blessed, but you'll be a blessing to somebody else. If you had Summer Vibes, you know that that's the call. That's the call. We're blessed to be a blessing. All right? Hey, listen, you can give uh, in one of three ways. You can give in the boxes in the back. You can give via Cash App, My Freedom DFW, or you can give on our website, MyFreedomDFW.com slash give. We would love for you to participate in what God is doing here at Freedom with us. If there's nothing else, let's get out of here because I'm hungry. Amen. God bless you. I love you. And we'll see you next week.